Tonight's Bible reading comes from Esther chapter 8 and in the Pew Bibles it can be found on page 493. 493 in the Pew Bibles. Esther chapter 8. That same day, King Xerxes gave Queen Esther the estate of Haman, the enemy of the Jews. And Mordecai came into the presence of the king, for Esther had told how he was related to her. The king took off his signet ring, which he had reclaimed from Haman, and presented it to Mordecai. And Esther appointed him over Haman's estate. Esther again pleaded with the king, falling at his feet and weeping. She beg begged him to put an end to the evil plan of Haman the Agagite, which he had devised against the Jews. Then the king extended the gold scepter to Esther, and she arose and stood before him. If it pleases the king, she said, and if he regards me with favour and thinks it the right thing to do, and if he is pleased with me, let an order be written overruling the dispatches that Haman, son, son of Amedatha, the Agagite, devised and wrote to destroy the Jews in all the king's provinces. For how can I bear to see disaster fall on my people? How can I bear to see the destruction of my family? King Xerxes replied to Queen Esther and to Mordecai the Jew, Because Haman attacked the Jews, I have given his estate to Esther, and they have hanged him on the gallows. Now write another decree in the king's name, in behalf of the Jews, as seems best to you, and seal it with the king's signet ring. For no document written in the king's name and sealed with his ring can be revoked. At once the royal secretaries were summoned on the 23rd day of the third month, the month of Savan. They wrote out all Mordecai's orders to the Jews and to the satraps, governors and nobles of the 127 provinces stretching from India to Kush. These orders were written in the script of each province and the language of each people and also to the Jews in their own script and language. Mordecai wrote in the name of King Xerxes, sealed the dispatches with the king's signet ring and sent them by mounted couriers who rode fast horses especially bred for the king. The king's edict granted the Jews in every city the right to assemble and protect themselves, to destroy, kill and annihilate any armed force of any nationality or province that might attack them and their women and children, and to plunder the property of their enemies. The day appointed for the Jews to do this in all the provinces of King Xerxes was the 13th day of the 12th month, the month of Adar. A copy of the text of the edict was to be issued as law in every province and made known to the people of every nationality so that the Jews would be ready on that day to avenge themselves on their enemies. The couriers riding the royal horses raced out, spurred on by the king's command, and the edict was also issued in the citadel of Susa. Mordecai left the king's presence wearing royal garments of blue and white, a large crown of gold and a purple robe of fine linen. And the city of Susa held a joyous celebration. For the Jews it was a time of happiness and joy, gladness and honour. In every province and in every city, wherever the edict of the king went, there was joy and gladness among the Jews with feasting and celebrating. And many people of other nationalities became Jews because fear of the Jews had seized them.
Thanks, Lynn. There are always some difficult names in the Old Testament that when I look at them and I think, I'm glad I'm not reading that. Um, but you did really well, so thank you. It's an interesting passage as we start getting nearer the end of the book of Esther. Um, we're starting to culminate into the well, building into when the people are able to defend themselves. Let's pray and ask that the Lord helps us to understand. Thank you that when we read of events that happened so many years ago that are so far removed from our existence that we can read them and see your hand at work in the lives of your people. We are so grateful that you are a God who has not changed since then. In the same way you worked back in Esther's day, you continue work to work today. And so we are able to draw confidence from your sovereign hand, even though at times you work in silent ways, unknown to us. We are so grateful that you care for your people so deeply, that you are engaged in their well-being, and that you are sovereign over all that happens to them. So as we once again understand your hand at work in this particular episode in the life of Esther and your people, may you help us to see its relevance for us today. And may we leave here as those who have been encouraged, rejoicing in our God. For Jesus' sake, amen. <clears throat> February the 11th, 1990. That's a long time ago, I know. Some of you weren't even born back then. But February the 11th, 1990 was a day that will be etched forever in my memory for two reasons. On the 11th of February 1990, I preached the first time ever in a church in the evening service, and I was terrified. I'd sweated all that week, I'd prepared a sermon, and I was so nervous standing up front there, and you'll be surprised to know I was done in 20 minutes. I think everyone rejoiced back then. Probably 20 minutes too long. The other date that stands out in my mind on the 11th of February 1990, can anyone guess what it is? It's related to South African history, so that's giving you a bit of a clue. A significant event happened. <laughs> not, not related to rugby. Very close, Martin, you're on the right track. What? It is, you're on the right track. Someone said it. Mandela was released. 11th of February, 1990. And, and there was this huge fanfare that had been going on. There had been portraits of what he may look like in the newspaper. And there was this great anticipation. And I will never forget sitting in front of a TV, watching with this incredible anticipation for him to be released. And the prison gates opened and he walked out in view of everyone. The cameras were all on, on him, 1990. What an incredible reversal of fortune. When we went back in 2000, we um, went to Robben Island, was, uh, where he was incarcerated for 17 of his 27 years. And he had this tiny little cell with just a little bed and a bucket for ablutions, and a little wash base, and that's all he had. And then they took us out the cell to where they would take them during the day and got them to work without sunglasses, which is why you often saw him wearing sunglasses. His eyes got damaged in this white sand, this kind of crystal where they made them dig for no good reason other than just to give them something to do, and resulted in them having their eyes get damaged from the UV rays coming off of this particular white crystallite or whatever it was they were digging. 
there was a man in prison, incarcerated, seemingly there for the rest of his life because it was a life sentence that was given to him in 1963 or 64, whenever it was given. And yet, 27 years later, in a complete reversal, he walked out of Polesmore Prison a free man. And four short years later, was elevated to the president of a country. Only in Africa. Can you imagine happening in Australia? I couldn't imagine it happening here. But it was an incredible reversal from having nothing, being mistreated, to now being the president of the country that put you in prison. This is a reversal of fortune story from Esther and Mordecai and God's people being under incredible threat of death, of being exterminated, wiped out. God, behind the scenes, reverses the situation completely. And even though God's name is not mentioned, as we've seen throughout the book, there are euphemisms that talk about God, that make it clear that God is, in fact, working in this story. And in this particular chapter, it is quite obvious that behind the scenes, God has so orchestrated events that they take Mordecai, who was going to be hanged, and Haman is hanged, and Mordecai is given, or Esther is given Haman's property, and then uh, she gives it to Mordecai to be able to take charge of. So that this wealth that Haman had, this incredible wealth, now is in the possession of his enemies. And his whole family has been decimated. And God raises up his people and enables them to be able to defend themselves. What an incredible story of reversal of fortunes. And what is true in this story is so true in the lives of believers because God takes us as those who are condemned, those who have no hope, those who are living in darkness, those who are shackled to Satan, those who are being robbed of life, of joy, of contentment, of purpose, of meaning. And he seats us in the heavenlies with himself. He grants us heavenly citizenship. He rescues us. He delivers us. He turns us around. And there have been so many stories in the history of Christianity of lives that have been so radically transformed by God. Only God can do that. But God is also able to take our situation when we are in desperate times, whatever trials we might experience. And when at times we feel exasperated because we don't know where to turn, we don't know what to do, we don't know how to get out of a situation, there's always God. And God is able to turn around our desperation into something positive and good, something for our benefit that becomes a great blessing in our lives. Firstly, I want you to notice how this works its way out in the promotion of Mordecai. Look at verses 1 and 2. The promotion of Mordecai. That same day, King Xerxes gave Queen Esther the estate of Haman, the enemy of the Jews. Notice how it mentions there the enemy of the Jews. It's being highlighted is the contrast between what happens to Haman and what happens to Esther and Mordecai. That's purposely put there. And the same day. What day? The same day that Haman is hanged. And Mordecai came into the presence of the king for Esther had told how he related, was related to her. The king took off his signet ring, which he had reclaimed from Haman, and presented to Mordecai, and Esther appointed him over Haman's estate. Now I want you to see what happens, what goes on here. There is a complete changing of the guard, a complete changing of posi a position uh, for Mordecai and for Esther. And, and the author is very deliberate in the way he writes the account. 
For on the same day that Haman is hanged in front of the people, Mordecai is now elevated to the position of prime minister. He takes over the position that Haman once had. And even though it's not clear, it's explicit that God is behind the scenes, ensuring that the fortunes of his people are able to experience great gain in the spite of a desperate situation from a human perspective and looking at it purely from a human level. He's not only promoted to prime minister, but he's given that signet ring. And that signet ring gives him great authority in the nation. So that when he passes the new edict, it is sealed with that signet ring. And it's the equivalent of the king speaking. It's a little bit like if you remember Joseph's situation, who also experienced an incredible reversal of fortune, who was languishing in prison when he is remembered, brought before the Pharaoh, and then elevated to second in charge out of all of Egypt. The same thing is going on here. Esther also appoints him over her estate and thus makes this whole reversal of fortunes complete. It's a wonderful reminder thus to us that in the most dire of circumstances, God can turn it around. The fortunes of God's people are not in the hands of the ungodly. It's so easy for us to think in terms of how we are subject to ungodly people. And there is a sense in which that is true. But your fortune is not dependent upon how secular people treat you. It's not even dependent upon how perhaps some Christians may treat you or may not treat you. Your fortune is dependent on God's sovereignty over you and God's goodness being poured out upon you and God's blessing resting upon you. We must never think that somehow we are completely at the whim and fancy of ungodly people who dictate the terms and the way in which you and I live. But rather, it is God who works behind the scenes, who can thwart the plans of the wicked, who can prevent them from accomplishing their evil intentions, who works always for the good of his people. And we are reminded of that where? In Romans Chapter 8, verse 28, and that verse is so badly translated. Your translation reads, all things work together for the good of those who love him and are called according to his purposes. The way the original puts it is like this. God is at work in all things for the good of his people and those who love him. In other words, the emphasis is on God working behind the scenes for good. So whatever situation you face in life, remember that it is God who lifts up the lowly, God who enables the humble to experience exaltation, God who is able to turn your life around, turn your situation around, take what seemingly is bad and make it into something that is good. 1 Samuel 2 verse 8, remember the prayer of Hannah? She prays and she says, uh, she, she, after God answers her prayer, she says, He raises the poor from the dust and lifts the needy from the ash heap. He seats them with princes and has them inherit a throne of honor. For the foundations of the earth are Yahweh's. Upon them he has set the world. Or Psalm 37 verse 34. Wait for Yahweh and keep his way. He will exalt you to inherit the land. When the wicked are cut off, you will see it. I've seen the wicked and ruthless man flourishing like a green tree in its native soil. But he soon passed away and was no more. Though I looked for him, he could not be found. Doesn't that give great encouragement to God's people to remind them that God raises uh, his people up. God elevates his people. God can turn lives around. 
And of course, this foreshadows. You cannot read this without seeing that the fortunes of Christ are being foreshadowed, are they not? Jesus, who is humiliated, Jesus, who is strung up on a cross, Jesus, who is condemned, the innocent for the guilty, Jesus, who suffers the penalty for sin, Jesus, who dies so cruel a death on the cross, whose enemies think they have triumphed, and yet, three days later, is raised from the dead, and 30 days or 40 days later, ascends into heaven and is now, we are told, seated at the right hand. And that's not a literal seating. That is a way in which the scripture says his work is complete. He is resting. He's finished his work. It's done and dusted. Accomplished on the cross. A complete reversal. And one day, we are told in Scripture, that the humble servant who came will return this time as a conquering king. Who would have thought when he was languishing on that cross and his disciples were despondent and dejected and fled and went back to their former profession of fishing, that it would all be turned around three days later. But that's what God does. That's how he works. To be sure, this may not always occur uh, to every single person. Some people will lose their lives when they are persecuted. Some will die at the hands of the wicked. We've seen that throughout the history of Christianity. This is not an ironclad guarantee that your fortunes are always going to turn around. But whatever else happens to you in this world, one thing is absolutely certain as a believer. Your future is secure. Your future is settled. And no one can rob you of that. For Christ has won it on the cross Secondly, I want you to notice the intercession of Esther. Look at verses 3 to 8. The intercession of Esther. Now, it's an incredible intercession. She speaks with, with such tact and such emotion. This is a young woman who is displaying wisdom far beyond her years. Wisdom that is coming from God and words in her mouth that God is literally putting in her mouth so that her words are not only heard by the king, but are responded to in a positive way. Listen to her tact. Esther again pleaded with the king, falling at his feet and weeping. How difficult is it for a man to resist a weeping woman? Isn't that true, men? I remember doing some counseling one, and the woman uh, I was uh, there began to cry. And I remember my heart melted uh, at her weeping. It's very hard to resist. She begged him to put to an end the evil plan of Haman, the Agagite, which he had devised against the Jews. Then the king extended the gold scepter to Esther, and she arose and stood before him. Now that just quickly, extending of the gold scepter is not a completely new occasion in which Esther is coming into his presence. This is a continuation of the previous scene. There's just a new set of speeches that now occur, so that she hasn't gone out of the presence of the king. She's still in the presence of the king. But nevertheless, the way in which she addresses the king is so favorable that he extends the scepter, and it's his way of saying, Esther, you've got my total attention. You've got my ear. Say what you want to say. I'm listening. If it pleases the king, she said, and if he regards me with favor and thinks it the right thing to do, and if he is pleased with me, let an order be written overruling the dispatches that Haman, the son of the Hamadata, the Agagite, devised and wrote to destroy the Jews in all the king's promise. Now look at how she frames her words. She doesn't say to the king, um, 
dismiss your previous decree because she realizes and understands that when the laws are written, they're written. And the king can't go back on the law that he's written. So look how she frames it. She doesn't call it a law. She calls it a dispatch. So she kind of changes the language and takes out some of the sting out of what she's asking the king to do. Notice also that she doesn't tell the king what to do. It's not as if Esther is commanding the king, listen, you do X, Y, and Z. But she suggests to him, she makes a very attractive suggestion and frames it in such a way that the king responds in a positive way. If it pleases you, she reminds him of her relationship to the king and thus the relationship that the king has not only to her, but to her people. And she also reminds the king that this vile Haman is the one who tried to accost her, who tried, in the words of the king, to rape her. And so Esther is playing on the sympathies of the king. She's not overstepping her mark. She's not saying too much. She's not saying too little. She's just saying the right amount of things and choosing the right words to say it. She continues, um, arose, and uh, uh, then she says, For how can I bear to see the disaster fall on my people? How can I bear to see the destruction of my family? I want you to notice, and there are going to be two contrasts here. The, the first contrast is between Esther and Haman. And the contrast that's being highlighted here is that Esther is concerned for her people. This isn't just about Esther. To be sure, Esther's life is under threat because she's a Jew. But now she's not pleading and saying, King, spare me. She's saying to the king, no, 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 this is about my people. This is about a wider body of people. In other words, there is no self-centeredness in Esther. She is completely other-oriented. Isn't that how Christians are meant to be? Isn't that what Jesus demonstrates to us? The Son of Man, who did not come to be served, but to serve and give his life a ransom for many. Jesus, who doesn't come so that people will serve him, but gives his life as the ultimate sacrifice because he is so other-centered, he is so concerned about rescuing humanity that nothing deters him from that vision of going to the cross. And even when his disciples try and dissuade him and say, don't go to Jerusalem, there's only death there, Jesus says, I must go, I must go. And here Esther demonstrates remarkable self-sacrifice in saying, it's not about me, king. This is about my people. And here's the second contra contrast. King Xerxes replied to Queen Esther and to Mordecai the Jew, because Haman attacked the Jews, I've given his estate to Esther, and they've hanged him on the gallows. Now, if we just pause there, this is characteristic of the character of the king. In effect, what he's saying to, to Esther is, I don't really care. I've done all that I can do. I mean, why are you bringing this request to me? He has this contrast. He's only concerned about him. He's not concerned about his people. He's not concerned about the destruction that may occur amongst his people. He's just interested in himself. And so he, he says to Esther, but, but I've given you stuff. I've given you Haman's stuff. I've given you his estate. What, what, what more can I do? And notice now how he completely takes the responsibility away from himself and places it on the shoulders of Mordecai. He is no better than what he did with Haman. Remember when Haman approached him, he said to Haman, go and write a decree and I'll sign off on it. Now he does exactly the same thing. He says to Mordecai, go and write a decree. I don't even need to see it. Just write it. Stick my ring on it. That's good enough. His character is consistent. Listen, let me read on. I'm not making this up. Um, 
now write another decree in the king's name in behalf of the Jews as seems best to you. You decide. You make up your mind. Put in whatever you want. And seal it with the king's signet ring. In other words, just plug the ring on it. You don't have to bring it to me. I'm not interested. For no document written in the king's name and sealed with the king's ring can be revoked. This king is so self-absorbed that when it comes to the care of his people in his kingdom, he cares nothing for them. In complete contrast to Esther, who is making intercession on behalf of her people. What greater contrast could there be than that? All this king does is he washes his hands and says, okay, I don't want to have anything to do with it. Mordecai, go ahead, write whatever you want to write. Put my ring on it and, and, and let it be. That's exactly what he did to Haman. Nothing's changed. Ironically, he has to write another law because he's written a bad law to begin with. It is highlighting to us this absurdity of a situation where the laws of a kingdom can be just written and rewritten and written and rewritten, where they completely contradict one another and leave you in a mess. But in spite of his disinterestedness, at least he gives them permission to do something, though he's not going to do anything. He stands back. And Esther's intercession wins the day. What a wonderful lesson intact in choosing one's words carefully when pleading a cause or pleading a case. Not being too hasty in what you say, but being led by the Spirit of God in the wisdom so that the words that come out of our mouths when we're engaged in a delicate discussion are words put there by the Spirit of God rather than just relying upon our own mouths. And such an intercession foreshadows and reminds us you cannot not see this of one who will come and now intercede on behalf of his people, who will now offer his life as an intercession, who will offer himself in the place of his people, who will not consider his life too valuable to give away, but will sacrifice everything so that his people can be reconciled to God. Furthermore, Jesus intercedes on behalf of his people once they come to him in faith. He prays on their behalf. We told that in Hebrews chapter 8, where Jesus is praying for you and I. So that when we bring our heart causes before him, and when we pour out our hearts, the Son of God takes our petitions and he presents them to the Father in perfect accordance with the will of the Father. Which gives us, as God's people, great confidence to bring our petitions before the Lord Jesus Christ. Thirdly, I want you to notice the proclamation of the decree, verses 9 through to 14. Now there's some difficult things here we uh, need to just deal with. At once the royal secretaries were summoned on the 23rd day of the third month, the month of Sivian. They wrote out all Mordecai's orders to the Jews and to the satraps, governors and nobles of the 127 provinces stretching from India to Kush. 
These orders were written in the script of each province and the language of each people, and also to the Jews in their own script and language. Mordecai wrote in the name of King Xerxes, sealed the dispatches with the king's signet ring, and sent them by mounted couriers who rode fast horses, especially bred for the king. Now, this is where the difficulty comes in. That's fairly obvious what's going on there. The king's edict granted the Jews in every city the right to assemble and to protect themselves, to destroy, kill, and annihilate any armed force of any nationality or province that might attack them and their women and children and to plunder the property of their enemies. Let's pause there. Now that raises, obviously, a difficult question we need to wrestle with, and I won't go through all the options lest we be here till the Lord returns. But the problem is that you're dealing now with an edict that says, okay, you can destroy women and children. And so there's a sense in which we may feel a kind of outrage. Surely that's taking it a step too far, isn't it? And the point that is being made here is that this is retributive justice. In other words, in the same way that the first edict gave permission to do certain things, this edict reverses that in order to give the Jews an opportunity to defend themselves. So when it talks about the killing of women and children, that is not indiscriminate killing of women and children as though they have given a clean slate where they can just go ahead and kill whatever women and children they want to kill, but rather it is the right to defend themselves against any woman or children who may be involved in the direct attack against them. So that if for whatever reason there are some who are engaged in that kind of activity, it gives the opportunity for the Jews to defend themselves. Now, you only need to go back not that far at a, a time, back to Nazi Germany to see how this played out in Nazi Germany. You had uh, women engage in some of those prison camps. I don't know if you've watched any of the documentaries after the war, and you see the anger being expressed against these prison women prison guards who treated the prisoners so cruelly and beat them and, and did all kinds of I inhumane things to them. You had children as well engaged in Nazism with some of those uh, youth things they had and dobbing in and uh, giving in uh, evidence people who were Jews or who supported Jews. And it's that kind of thing that's happening. Let me read one of the commentators. In fact, you all know, oh, not all of you, some of you know David Firth. This is David Firth's uh, commentary. Yet the women and children are not defenseless innocents, but rather are among those attacking the Jews. Lest we think this a strange concept, we need only think back to the attacks in the Holocaust or Bosnia to realize it's entirely plausible. So the offer to the Jews is purely defensive. Though a defense where the terms of engagement are shaped through an almost exact series of quotations from chapter 3, verses 12 to 13, so we understand that this is nothing more than a nullification of Haman's decree. Violence cannot here be avoided, but it can be minimized. So that's all that's happening here. They're just given the opportunity to defend themselves against those who are attacking them. And even though it says they're entitled to the plunder because the people who were attacking them could take plunder from the Jews, we are told in chapter 9, verse 10, and chapter 9, verse 15, that the Jews take no plunder. In other words, they understand the essence of what this decree is saying the right to defend themselves. Now, we need to be careful here. This is not about revenge. We mustn't think of this as the Jews being able to avenge themselves on their enemies. This is about self-defense, that they are being attacked and they are given the right to defend themselves against the attack. Vengeance is ultimately the Lord's. And you and I need to be careful that when we are attacked, whether that be verbally or physically, we don't take matters into our own hands. It's so tempting, is it not? 
when lies are spread about you or falsehoods are said about you or things that are done to you that are just hurtful. It's so tempting to want to take action and to lash out against those who have committed the offense against you. But we are reminded in Romans chapter 12, verse 19, Do not take revenge, my friends, but leave room for God's wrath, for it is written, It is mine to avenge. I will repay, says the Lord. Let's leave revenge to the Lord. He's more than capable of righting our wrongs. Moreover, in a broader sweep of theology, what's happening here is a fulfillment of the promise of Abraham. In Genesis chapter 12, verse 3, remember what God says to Abraham, those who bless you, I will bless. Those who curse you, I will curse. And this is fulfillment of that. If the people are cursing the Israelites by trying to wipe them out, God will curse them. In other words, what's interesting here is the good of the nation, the Persian nation, is bound up to some extent with how they treat the Israelites, how they treat the Jews. Now, when we find a parallel to this in the New Testament, What's interesting is that nothing has changed. Not talking about the Jews now, but rather we are told in Scripture that were it not for the elect in the world, the days would be shortened. In other words, God's care for his own people is so important to him that the way in which they are treated in society is also a concern for God. And that when his people are treated well, it bodes well for a society. When his people are mistreated, it doesn't bode well for a society. The same principle applies. And then finally, notice the response of the people, verses 15 to 17. The response. Mordecai left the king's presence wearing royal garments of blue and white, large crown of gold and purple, robe of linen, and the city of Susa held a joyous celebration. Now, why is that significant? Can you remember what happened way back in chapter 3? In chapter 3, what happened when the edict was passed? What was the result of the people? They were confused. They didn't understand. Contrast this now with this edict that results in joyous celebrations. Um, God, it's a reminder that God has not abandoned them, that God has not forsaken his people. For we are reminded in Scripture, no matter how bleak things look, never will I leave you, never will I forsake you. Hebrews chapter 13, verse 5. And God's people are experiencing that. Notice, second, the effect upon the Persians. Now, while there's some ambiguity here in how it's framed in the original language, the point nevertheless remains the same. For the Jews, it was a time of happiness and joy, gladness and an opposite to previously where it was feasting and mourning and uh, in sackcloth and ashes, a complete reversal but notice the effect. In every province and in every city, wherever the edict of the king went, there was joy and gladness among the Jews with feasting and celebrating, and many people of other nationalities became Jews because of fear of the Jews had seized them. Now, now what that means is difficult to completely uh, get to the, the, the meaning. But it seems to be indicating that there were a lot of people who began to at least at minimum adopt the customs of the Jews and began to celebrate the same customs of the Jews. There's an interesting uh, story I read of, of Ronald Reagan. Do you all know who Ronald Reagan is? For some of you younger ones, he was the president of the USA. And if you remember, Ronald Reagan was shot uh, while going into a car by a would-be assassin. 
And as he was being prepared for surgery, and I quote, he jokingly said to the medical team, I hope all of you are Republicans. One of the doctors replied, Mr. President, today all of us are Republicans. That's kind of what was happening there. That was the attitude of the people in the Persian Empire. Today, all of us are Jews. It's a wonderful way in which we see the profound way in which God can enable his people to have a positive effect upon the society. And you and I as Christians are called to be what? Salt and light. And as we continue to demonstrate our Christianity, as we live it out, so there ought to be a corresponding, joyous, positive response from the people to whom we are expressing and living out our Christianity. In other words, our lives should be so transformed by Christ, so submitted to Jesus, so on fire for him, that the joy of Christ should spill over into our world so that others may see in us something of the joy of our Christianity. It's also another reminder to live humbly before God, is it not? It's very easy to try and push our cause, whereas what we see here is Esther and Mordecai humbly living before God accepting what God's hand provides for them. And as a result of not trying to push themselves on the king, God elevating them to positions of prominence. We are warned of the danger of pride in Scripture. Sitting down, Jesus said to the twelve, If anyone wants to be first, he must be the very last and the servant of all. Proverbs 29, 23. A man's pride brings him low, but a man of lowly spirit gains honor. The temptation that you and I face is to elevate ourselves. And the medicine to that is to walk humbly before God and let God do the elevating. Let God raise us up. Humble yourselves, 1 Peter 5, 6. Humble yourselves under the mighty hand of God, and He will lift you up. And when God lifts you up, everyone will know. And there will be great joy celebrated as a result of that. God exalts His people in the eyes of the Persians. They are lifted up, this humble people who are minority in the Persian Empire, who are far outnumbered, probably eight to one, are now exalted in the eyes of the people because God has been at work in the background as they have lived out humbly before him. Is that not true of you and I? To live humbly before our God and to allow him to be the one who bestows upon us honor, and elevation, prominence, as he did for Esther, as he did for Mordecai. Who would have thought this niece of Mordecai would have been plucked out of obscurity, elevated into the palace, and her uncle would become prime minister? Do you see what God can do in the lives of his people? What a great God we have. Never, ever underestimate the power of what God is able to do when you walk humbly before him. Who knows that some of you may be elevated into great positions of prominence and power for the good of God's people and the good of this nation. Amen. Our Father, we thank you for your word that is a wonderful reminder of the reversal of fortunes. We thank you that you can take 
those who are lowly and despised in the world and raise them up. What a great God you are. And there may be some here that you will do that, Lord. You know every heart before you this morning. You know every person this evening. You know everyone. Nothing's hidden from your sight. And I pray that as they seek to serve you, as they seek to walk humbly before you, that you will be pleased amongst this group of people to raise some of them up to great positions of prominence for the good of your name, for the glory of your name, and the good of your people. For Jesus' sake, amen. Let's stand as we sing our final song.